Hi all, this is our framing video that's intended to carry us over from our introduction to media ecology and talking about Marshall McLuhan um, to talking a little bit more about like preface to Plato um, and particularly holding over or off of a little some of the things that we talked about a bit on the Eisenstein piece as well. I've got some comments that I'm about to post as well on last week's discussion forum, um, particularly the sort of last little bit of questions about the most confusing passages. And so please do go back to that voice thread and kind of go through that particular slide and sort of see my responses, because I think that's really helpful for making sense of the McLuhan piece. But what I want to do here is talk a little bit about some of the sort of big picture takeaways from McLuhan and then sort of carry us over into preface to Plato. So the first thing that we'll talk about is um, McLuhan and it's this like what I really want to emphasize um, is a bit about this idea of hot and cold media. So one of the questions that you might ask yourself is like, okay, well, let's get some examples of what kinds of things are hot media and what kinds of things are cool media, right? And I think we can sort of think about this a little bit more sort of by example in some sense. So hot media are examples of um, things like reading printed text, um, listening to the radio as a kind of hot media, um, whereas cool media are things like having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone, um, perhaps a um, maybe you would go to a um, like live music night or something and there'd be or like a sort of like open mic night and you'd listen to some people sort of like sharing poetry or reading short stories. That would be a kind of cool media. The really big difference between hot media and cool media is that hot media um, puts a lot of emphasis on one particular kind of sense. So if you're thinking about listening to the radio, we have to use our ears and our sort of capacities to hear a lot. And it's not just that we're sort of like these kinds of open receptors into like hearing the sounds that come in. We also do a lot of interpretation through our ears. So we're like reading into the story or what someone is saying by paying attention to things like the tone of their voice, whether they're centering, right? We're, we're trying to construct a sense of how they're feeling about something in order to sort of paint a story. And so we're reading in and building in a lot more. And all of that is happening usually through our ears, right? Because if you're just listening to an audio stream, that's really where the information is coming in. Similarly, if you were to be reading a novel, per se, to yourself, um, it's true, like in your head, you've probably got this like rich world that's being imagined. But all of that rich world and all of the details from it are being constructed by your reading the text, right? So you're taking um, this like one kind of input and sort of then extracting from it a wider variety of content in some sense. So when we think about hot media, I really like to think of it as a kind of density, right, of like what's going on. We can contrast that with something like a face-to-face -face conversation that you have with someone where you're very sensitive to the space that you're in, perhaps. You can watch someone's body language you can listen to the tone of their voice. Um, so it's a lot more holistic approach to sort of understanding the information that's being presented to you because it's kind of coming in all at once through a different, through different, like through different senses of yours. And as a result, like you're not sort of overly relying on one particular way of understanding what's coming in. It's interesting because McLuhan actually gives the example of a cartoon as actually being an example of a certain kind of cool media. And I think that it's helpful to sort of think about this. Um, you know, when you think about a lot of cartoons, they're not like these like deep Da Vinci's with like very like rich, you know, like gradient colors. Like instead, a lot of times they're um, like if you think about a New Yorker cartoon, 
like they're usually black and white, pretty simple strokes to sort of just shape the outlines of different kinds of shapes and pictures um, with a little bit of text. And um, there are a lot of cartoons where if you weren't sort of in the moment or like at like reading it for the time that it like they're really like, like for the time that the cartoon was made, you'd be confused about what the joke was because a lot of these cartoons are really sort of tracking a lot of sort of social contextual stuff that's just kind of floating around in the in the cultural nethers, right? So in that sense, they're more of a cool medium than say something like, um, you know, like reading a novel in part because so much of it is more contextual and you have to ha be aware of a lot more. Like it's not just your visual sense. It's also kind of like what's going on historically or sort of around you. This highlights, I think, really something important, um, two important points actually about McLuhan. Um, the first is that when we think about the distinction between hot and cold media, like media, it's not like a dichotomy where something is either hot or it's cold. Instead, there's a spectrum and things can be sort of like warmer and cooler. And the other thing is that as you read a lot of McLuhan, which fortunately you guys aren't gonna have to do, um, there's nothing innate about any given like media itself. It's really much more about the context in which it's consumed in a particular point in time and by a particular group of people. This is where I wanna use this to sort of segue into thinking about Preface to Plato. So Preface to Plato um, is a piece that's very oftenly assigned in the discipline of classics. And it's really about um, Plato's Republic and it's about a particular aspect of Plato's Republic. Um, some of you may have read this, um, you know, in introductory philosophy classes or gen eds or just sort of at other sort of points in time, and you don't need to remember a lot about it. Um, the only thing that you need to know about Plato's Republic is that in several passages throughout the book, it becomes very clear that Plato hates poetry. He hates poetry. He thinks it's awful. <laughs> He's like, this is damaging to society. We are ruining the minds of the weak. We are like corrupting the youth. Poetry is terrible. And I really like using this example um, in part because I think so often we kind of can get in our own, like we can get really sort of embedded in our own little place and time where we're concerned about different kinds of media, like challenges or worries that we have about new media today and so we'll say things like oh social media it's terrible it's like ruining everything um and it's easy for us to focus on the features of that one technology without quite recognizing the ways in which it turns out people generally have a lot of big feelings and issues with new technology generally and particularly with new ways of sharing information and so I like to assign preface to Plato because it is an examination of Plato's attitudes and why he hates poetry. Um, and I think this is really like, like he hates poetry? What, like really poetry, poetry is the problem here, right? Like people are just always like, well, that's odd. Um, and there are two things to note here. One is just that um, Plato is in some sense um, he's really thinking about a new kind, like a new kind of way of sharing information. Um, it's more of this um, sort of the, like kind of epic poetry where it's this story. Um, it's this very, very like, when I say, I mean, when I say epic, like it's kind of like Game of thrones -ish. You could really imagine like drums beating in the background, right? Like you think about the Iliad and like battle scenes, like it's epic. It's sentimental, right? It makes us feel things. And he, um, in the past, like when we think about poetry today, we mostly imagine that we just like read it and then like it happens in our head. But in, po in Plato's time, poetry was actually performed in front of people um, and people would sort of like listen to it and also then there would be people who would perform it. And it was this particular aspect, this sort of performative component um, and the sort of like the ways in which it would like sort of grip people and it would be really emotionally compelling that Plato was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, like what, wait, are we, are we sure we want people to really empathize with 
a character who just literally raised a city. Like, are we sure? Because I don't know about that, right? Like, Plato's worried about the sort of effects on us when we sort of immerse ourselves into a particular world. And he says that, look, that changes us. Like, that changes how we feel about things. It expands our capacity for empathy. That's sort of the way I would frame it. But, like, in some sense, that's a very modern framing. The way that Plato would say about, like, talk about it would be like, well, yeah, but, like, literature changes you. And it's not at all clear that it changes you for the better. Because what, like, you know, we sort of think that it's, like, better no matter what if you have empathy for anyone. And Plato's very skeptical that, like, well, no, like, sometimes people are just villains and you wouldn't want to empathize with them. So we're not so concerned about that. Um, what we're concerned about is this general trend of sort of having a hard time or worrying about the social consequences of certain kinds of popular ways of construing media. So Plato is already doing that in Plato's Republic. Like he is already worried about the corrupting power of poetry. And so as we're thinking about this, we want to keep in mind two different kinds of things. One, I think it's really helpful to have this history and think about the different effects of different kinds of modes of communication and how information is normally construed in a particular context. And that is the second point. It's in a particular context. There's nothing innate about any particular kind of media. Um, instead, it's like, how is this consumed and what are the sort of social, like, what is the sort of social environment around that such that it produces those specific consequences? So that's why I like using the like, like preface to Plato because um, when you think about poetry, we have a sense of what poetry is today. And it's very different from the way that poetry was consumed during the time that Plato was writing and railing about the evils of poetry. So I think it's really helpful for us to take a bit of the long view and sort of think about just sort of generally these kinds of changes and how they might go about or what kinds of ramifications there might be before we really dig deep into thinking about digital culture and what we wanna say about there. Because I think it's easier to notice certain features of the discussion when it's happening a little bit, like at a little bit of a remove. And so this is kind of our first step before we really dig into our media environment today and its consequences or sort of potential issues or just sort of the culture surrounding media.